those folks who may be watching online. We broadcast all of our seminars that we do at noon online at our website, carpenterhazelwood.com slash live. And the cool thing about that is there's no usernames, no passwords. It's kind of like a TV channel. You tune in, and if there's programming on, uh, you watch it. If there's no programming on, then you just get a blank screen. But uh, we're excited about being able to do that here at our first seminar of the spring schedule. And today we're talking about parking. We call this community gridlock. And before we start, I want to disabuse you of the idea that I've got some kind of magic bullet or magic potion here that's going to solve all of your parking problems. My goal today is to try to give you a different perspective as to why we have these problems and a different way of looking at uh, perhaps why your community struggles with this. That's not necessarily the solution. I'll give you a couple of ideas of what to do about it. And at the end, we'll talk a bit about the legislature and what they may have in store for this topic. So when we talk about community gridlock, here's an example. I'm not going to show very many pictures, but here's an idea of something that's maddening in communities. This is a picture of a guy who's got his RV behind a pickup truck. By, a, by the way, the pickup truck itself is not the problem, but you'll notice that it's a four-wheel, uh, four-door large cab pickup truck. And for a lot of you, the CCNRs that were drafted back in the 70s and 80s didn't contemplate pickup trucks that are as big as pickup trucks are today. Uh, but that's not the problem with the picture, of course. The problem is the RV. Now, you can't tell by looking at it, but let me tell you that this is in the town of Gilbert. And that street is owned by the town of Gilbert. It's a publicly dedicated street. And as you can see, the RV is not blocking anybody's driveway. Well, as it turns out, this RV is parked in front of someone house, uh, the neighbor, in other words, the person who owns the RV does not live in the house that's in the picture. So he's parked it in front of someone else's house in the town of Gilbert. And this is a problem, of course, because the guy who owns the home is thinking, hey, I didn't sign up for this. And the town of Gilbert is saying, well, you know, maybe we'll get to it, maybe we won't, we'll send an officer out, maybe they'll talk to the guy, maybe not. But it is a public street after all. So what do we do about this? Well, when we talk about parking, and this and other issues, when we talk about parking, uh, we're going to talk about community expectations, because that's the key. It's where you have to start with this whole topic is, what do the owners want when it comes to parking? Because a community association that tries to do something different or what the owners want is a community association that's going to be in turmoil. And it may not even exist uh, in, in the way that it, it, you might think it would. Then the owners get done removing the board and and changing things and firing the management company, et cetera. So we'll talk a minute about the expectations of the community. We have to talk about the community documents and what they say about the topic, because that's the beginning. And in sometimes it's also the end of the question. What do the community documents say? And as we look at a few examples, you'll see why the documents are perhaps the most maddening part of this challenging problem. Talk for a minute about towing, but not a whole lot of time on the topic. We're going to talk about cities and their basic attitude toward parking and how they intersect with the association and its structure. And then finally, we're going to talk about the legislature. So when we talk about community expectations, uh, I don't know how many of you have been around long enough to remember an attorney named Brian Zemp. actually started this law firm. And when I started practicing law in 94, I started working for him. Law offices of Brian Zemp at our law firm today is the predecessor of that firm. He passed away with a health issue in the year 2000. And I loved what he used to say about rules, and it applies to parking restrictions and the rest. And he used to say this, the rules of a community should reflect the way most people in the community live without thinking twice about it. The rules should reflect the way most people in the community live without thinking twice about it. In other words, your rules and your conduct-based restrictions in your CCNRs should predict and be aligned with the way everyone would live their life if they never thought about the HOA. The rules should be for the margin. So if in your community everyone has a job and they work nine to five, then your trash can expectation would be that the trash cans be pulled behind the gate by the next day. So if the trash pickup is at 7 a.m., you wouldn't have a rule that says they have to be pulled back behind the gate by 10 a.m. because people are all working. So in the community where people are working all the time, you would never have a rule that says the trash cans have to be pulled back within an hour of the trash pickup. If you have a community where no one goes to a job 9 to 5, perhaps active adult, 
you might have a rule that says the trash cans have to be pulled back by noon the day of trash pickup. Now I say that purely by way of example. I don't know any communities that would require a trash can to be moved that quickly. But by way of example, the Brian Zemp rule is that your rules should follow the sweet spot of the way most people would live without ever thinking about the HOA. And you know this intuitively. The rules are for the marginal behavior. The loud parties at 3 a.m., that's one out of 100 homeowners that do that. We're human. We need our sleep. Uh, you know, but you, your rules should refer to the marginal behavior. So when we talk about parking, it becomes clear why this is such a problem. What is the marginal behavior with parking? What is the sweet spot down the center? What is the way that most people would live? And what contributes to this is the expansion of families. As a basic population theory, families get bigger. Uh, two people have three kids. Uh, those three kids have two kids each. Before you know it, in a couple of generations, the population has expanded. So not only is our country's population expanding, the world's population expanding, but the population of a household tends to expand over time. Now, there are contraction events. People pass away. People get divorced. But essentially, the average household tends to get bigger, not smaller, over the life of a community. So when these kids become teenagers, where are they going to park? I have three teenagers, three, three teenage daughters, 14, 17, and 19, and they all want cars. Before you know it, that's five cars. You know, standard household, my wife and I both have cars. Do we have room for five cars? Absolutely not. Um, and they're not all getting car anyway. But the point is that uh, families expand over time, and now you have people who are boomeranging. You've got three-generation families where... Um, someone's out of a job, they're in their 20s, they have a kid, they're married, they've got to live with their parents. Before you know it, you've got three generations and four vehicles. And so this, this is a problem that community associations confront because the architecture of the homes, the units, whatever, is not necessarily designed for all these vehicles. The vehicles themselves are bigger. I don't know if you all know what a striker van is. It's a Mercedes vehicle. It's very large. Uh, and you'd say, is it a truck? Is it a van? It can be converted into an RV. I've got a client that recently asked me about it, and it turns out that this guy had done a conversion to it. It retails for $102,000, this striker van. Is it an RV or not? Well, it's sort of a van, but it's clearly, you'd say, looking at it, it's an RV. It's got a canopy. It has a generator, uh, all of those things that make it an RV. CCNRs that were drafted in 1987 did not even consider a Mercedes striker van conversion that retails for $102,000. So part of our problem is we're taking old definitions and trying to fit modern vehicles into them, and that can be a challenge. And I don't know if this is just our observation or not, what you're experiencing. It just seems like there's more RVs out there now. And RVs are in places that, that maybe they shouldn't be. Here's the question. And I'm not an RV guy. How long should it take someone to load up their RV before taking off for two weeks? Two days? One day. One day. Let's see, for three days, 72 hours. See, I think it has to do with, with how particular you are. You know, if you're really particular about these things, you're, you're doing the laundry, you're getting stuff packed in there, you're getting the water all set up. Does it take three days, two days, one day? To some people, they might, they might say, well, it takes an hour. What's the problem? Why do you have to take two days to load up your RV? We'll see an example set of CCNRs that really highlight this problem when it comes to loading and unloading and how RV ownership can change the direction of the conversation. All right, so when we talk about community expectations, the last point I'll make here is that if your parking restriction is imposing on most of your owners, then it really should be changed. Your parking restriction is never going to work. You're always going to have turmoil about parking if your parking restriction, as written, messes with the regular lifestyle of most of your residents. That's intuitively obvious. But here's where we get into trouble. When we confront a CCNR provision that, for whatever reason, is impractical or impossible for you, because you tell us that, you say, Scott, we've got this provision. It says, you know, you can only have one car at a time in the entire household, and it's impossible. Even the board members can't comply with it. And I say, amend it. Let's go to the membership. Propose an alternative. 
Let's make it two cars or three cars, whatever makes sense. What's the sweet spot of the uh, average owner? Two cars. Okay, we'll change it to two. And then you tell me, well, Scott, you know, there are a few people who are kind of one car people, and I'm not sure they're going to vote for it. So, well, how many of them are there? And you say, well, maybe 20%. So, well, your CCNRs take 75% to amend. I'm making that number up. It's whatever number is in your community. Let's say it's 75. So, okay, so if 20% are one car people, then we need 75% to vote for the amendment to make it two car people are allowed in the community. You've only got 5% who are not going to vote. You need everybody to participate. And I've been doing this for 19 <coughs> years. You've got people who are not going to participate because they just don't. So you're never going to get that amendment passed because your number of people who are one car people is low, is high, I mean, making the amendment impossible. So when I say enforce or amend, enforce the one car restriction in my hypothetical or amend it to be two, I make it sound really simple. You either enforce it or you amend it. But we've been doing this around here long enough to know that that is a <coughs> dramatic oversimplification. That in the real world, it's, we can't enforce it, Scott. Why? Well, because we'll lose the court cases because judges are never going to enforce a one-car restriction. And the homeowners would never stand for it. The board would be run out of town. We'd be removed. The management company would be fired. Let's just accept as a proposition we can't enforce it. And then I said, well, why can't you amend it? Scott, we just can't, okay? I don't want to explain it to you again, but we don't have enough people who pay attention. The one car people are going to lobby the rest of the people. It's going to be a whole big thing. We can't amend it. Trust me on that. And I said, well, I, I, okay, I'll concede. You can't enforce it. You can't amend it. Well, then let's just admit that we've got a serious legal problem. Because now you have people who say, hey, I bought in here expecting a one-car situation. You're not enforcing it. I'm now going to sue the association for failure to enforce. And frankly, they've got a pretty good case. Yeah. Or if you say, um, we'll enforce it, that's a problem too. That's a condition on the ground that we can't solve as lawyers, and you can't solve as managers, and boards can't solve either. So let's at least try to explain how this happens. How do we end up with community documents that are so misaligned to the community's expectations. Let's go through some examples and we'll see how this happens. When we talk about community documents, we're talking about the CCNRs nine times out of ten. So when I talk about these examples, we're talking about CCNRs. And what we have to do with CCNRs, and this is true in any topic that we deal with, parking is just the one of the day, we have to take the provisions at face value. They say what they say. It's a sentence with a beginning, a middle, and an end, hopefully a subject and a predicate and some good grammar in between, that we have to say every word has meaning and we take it at face value. Remind ourselves that in the parking context, CCNRs are still a contract. This is important because there is a growing belief out there that when it comes to parking, especially on publicly owned streets, that somehow the CCNRs don't apply. Like, how can the CCNRs apply to property owned by the town of Gilbert or the city of Phoenix. We sort of can get ourselves tangled up there. So I'm going to untangle it for you. It's as simple as it's always been. The CCNRs are a contract. Which means that in America, I can enter into an agreement with you where I say, you know, I know that I have the right to paint my house purple. Because Maricopa County doesn't care. Now, maybe the city of Scottsdale would care. Maybe, but let's just say you're in a county island. You're not in a municipality, but you're in Maricopa County. Let's accept as a given today that if I want to paint my house purple, I can. I don't need anybody's permission. There's not going to be any color police coming by, no code enforcement from Maricopa County. I can paint my house purple in a Maricopa County island. But when I enter into that CCNR contract that says, I will not paint my house without the prior approval of the architectural committee. And the architectural committee says it has to be earth tones. I have entered into a contract where I agreed not to do something that I was otherwise legally entitled to do. I agreed to not exercise my right to paint my house purple. Here's the key. When I buy into a community with a CCNR provision that says owners in this association will not park their cars in the street even though the street's owned by the town of Gilbert. I can do that. In America, I can agree to do something. I can agree not to do something I'm otherwise legally entitled to do. 
And we all, when we all enter into the same agreement, that's an enforceable contract. We have to remind ourselves of that. We'll talk a little later about how the legislature perhaps has a different view, that the association ought not to be involved in city-owned streets. What they might say is, hey, the association can only deal with conduct on property owned by the association. That has some surface appeal to it. You sort of think, yeah, OK, that makes some sense. The association can only deal with conduct on property owned by the association. If that were true, and by the way, that's not true, but if that were true, then the association could only deal with conduct in the common area. But the association deals with conduct on lots all the time. Why? How? Because you agreed. Association is simply enforcing the agreement you struck when you purchased. So there's still a contract, and the CCNRs still matter. So let's look at a couple of examples. This is where we get into the first problem with parking. Let's look at this one. All vehicles of owners and of their lessees, employees, guests, and invitees, shall be kept in garages or residential driveways. Shall be kept, this is mandatory, must be kept in garages or residential driveways of the owners wherever and whenever such facilities are sufficient to accommodate the number of vehicles on a lot. It's common provision. Here's the problem. What in the world does sufficient mean? What does that mean? It is a waste of ink, I suppose, uh, this provision. A couple of things about this. Sufficiency is the huge question here. Because the first half of it, the first underlined portion, clearly is a prohibition. It says you cannot park anywhere except in the garage and the driveway, but then you get this qualifier, this sufficiency qualifier. So here's the question. Sufficient according to what standard? Because we've had a lot of cases where it's insufficient. The garage and the driveway is insufficient, and we get one of two different scenarios. We get the too many cars scenario, you have a sufficiency problem because the garage holds two cars, the driveway holds two cars, and the person has five cars. Now you look at that provision and say, is the garage and the driveway sufficient to accommodate the number of vehicles on a lot? You say, no, it's not, because you have five cars, four spaces to park, two in the garage, two on the driveway. Too many cars, that's the one scenario. The second scenario that we confront with this kind of provision is too much junk in the garage. <laughs> and by junk, I mean jet skis or the 1965 Ford Mustang that the guy's been tinkering with for 15 years, or just boxes, just junk, hoarding kind of stuff. Can an owner create their own sufficiency problem, either by virtue of the number of cars or because of the stuff in the garage? Based purely on this provision, I'd say yes, that's the problem. So we might ask ourselves this question. How do we end up with CCNR provisions like this? Kathy characterizes it as a waste of ink, a waste of space. It is in a way. So I've got two theories on this. One theory goes like this. Uh, developers sitting around saying, you know, let's do the next subdivision. 200 lots. Gosh, it's just like the last one. Call the lawyer up and tell him, hey, do CCNRs for this new project. Here's the new legal description. Uh, but don't, don't do anything different. We like it the way it was the last time. Or the developer says to the attorney, here, we want some CCNRs for this project. Here's a set we like from a different community. Could you do something like that to keep the cost down? Or the developer takes the Microsoft Word document from the last time they did it. They change the name, and they just record it themselves. They don't use a lawyer to record the next set of CCNRs. So the one explanation for how this provision ends up in your CCNRs is developer inattention. It just kind of got there because it just was there the last time and the time before that. And they hadn't gotten any main complaints. And the salespeople in the model homes have never said, you're losing sales over that parking provision. You want to figure out the fastest way for CCNR forms of developers to change is if buyers tell the people at the sales office, you just sold me that home, but section 5.17 of the CCNR is just horrible. Do you think that happens very often? No, it almost never happens. Why? Well, that's on buyers. Buyers are buying homes and products. They're not buying off the CCNRs. And I suppose we would just accept that as a given. But that's not happening. So how do CCNRs change over time? Sometimes you're just stuck with them. So one explanation for how you end up with a provision like this, developer inattention. 
But the alternative view, as I said I had two theories about this, is the, almost the exact opposite. You look at this provision and you say, maybe this isn't an accident. Maybe this is intentional. Maybe this is extremely intentional. Why would that be? Well, when people buy homes, the theory is that they fit into one of three camps when it comes to cars. You're either a low car person, few cars, don't like cars in the community, want to have as few cars as possible, or you're a high car person, meaning you have lots of cars and you don't care, or you're ambivalent about the topic. So forget about the ambivalence. Your CCNRs are going to either appeal to the people with lots of cars or the people without lots of cars. Now if you read this provision from the standpoint of how will it be perceived by low car people and high car people, now all of a sudden it reads entirely differently. Let's say you're a low car person. You have one car, you're kind of green minded. The idea of driving through the community with cars wall to wall every night because of all the, you don't want there to be a lot of cars. You read this provision and you say, I want to buy here. Why? It starts out with a restriction. You have to park in garages or driveways. And then you come to the sufficiency question, but the sufficiency question, people are going to fill that in with their own bias. And they're going to say, well, I'll only confront a car on the street if there's an insufficiency. That's pretty good. It starts with a restriction. So a low car person might find this provision to be right in line with their expectations. If you're a high car person and you read this provision, you're going to see that sufficiency loophole as permission. So the first half is a restriction, the second half is permission, and maybe this provision is drafted this way on purpose so that buyers among the entire spectrum of their attitudes toward cars will read it and see exactly what they want to see. Because they fell in love with the model anyway. For the one in a hundred, I don't know what the number is, but for the few people that read the CCNRs, if they actually stumble across this provision, actually read about it and actually think about it, the average person will probably see the provision as right in line with their expectation. Now we end up in the community a couple of years later, there's cars everywhere, the low car people come to the board meeting and say, you know, there's a restriction that says you have to park in the garage or the driveway. Board pulls it out, you're the manager, you're sitting there thinking about it and you say, gosh, this is kind of strange. That's how we end up with these things. So I don't know which it is, if it's inattention or if it's intentional, but when you really think about it from the mind of a buyer, you could probably see this as a restriction or as permission. And then as board members, managers, and lawyers years later, this is what we're dealing with, and that's one of the reasons why parking is so frustrating. Let's go to another quick example. Here's another one. No automobile or other motor vehicles shall be parked on any road or street in the project except for automobiles or motor vehicles of guests of owners, which may be parked on a road or street in the project for a period of not more than 48 hours during any seven-day period. So again, it's kind of a challenge in the sense that it says owners, but the guests can stay. You say, how does this happen? Well, the idea here is that the owners are not supposed to park anywhere they want to. But the automatic thinking is, well, what about somebody who comes over to play poker or somebody who comes by to have tea or someone who's mowing the grass or doing some housekeeping or a contractor or plumber or something like that? And you say, well, OK, we'll let there be some exception for that. And one of the questions I received this morning, because we did the same program this morning at a breakfast at 830, is, well, is the child of an owner an owner or a guest? So back to my example. I got three children, 14, 17, and 19. They don't own the house. I do. Are they guests? Well, when my daughter's home from college, I, she feels like, because she's in the guest room now, I mean, maybe she feels like a guest, but um, I don't think children of owners are guests. But if I were 80 and my child was 62, that's, they're a guest in my home, I think. So guest is even ambiguous here. Uh, but what we see with a provision like this is people kind of play games with it. They move the car around, they count the days, and that's maddening for you. But this provision was drafted in an attempt, again, so that buyers who are either pro-car or anti-car, whichever way you want to put it, will read what they want to read. Let's look at this one. Back to our RV example. No vehicle shall be parked or maintained on any public or private street except for such period of time as shall be reasonably necessary to load or unload. 
This only really becomes a problem with RVs, and we've got the 72 hours, the 48 hours, the 24 hour expectation. That's where it gets to be a problem is when people want to park their RV under the auspices of loading and unloading, but you think they're living there. They've got the, you know, the, the power cord, the water, everything's connected. And you say, hey, you're obviously living there. It's been on the street for three days. And the person says, well, I'm loading. I'm going to be gone for two weeks. <clears throat> and that's not violating the restriction. Your only argument then is reasonableness. Now, if you want to know what the law's vortex is, it's the word reasonable. That is a vortex. <clears throat> what defines reasonable under the facts and circumstances of a particular situation? In our RV example, if you wanted to litigate that, which this stuff never actually gets litigated for whatever reason, people don't have an economic incentive to spend thousands of dollars defending their right to have their RV in the street for four days. Uh, these things tend to get worked out. But if we were to litigate it, what would the lawsuit look like? Well, it'd be pretty simple at the beginning. You'd have some board members testify, hey, I see it there. It's been there for five days. The guy says he's loading. The homeowner would say, I'm loading. And you know, some cross-examination might get a little testy on the witness stand. But he's basically going to say, hey, um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm really detail-oriented. Everything's got to be perfect. And I've got a routine. I've got a checklist. And he pulls out a four-page checklist of things he's got to do before he can go off on his trip. So the homeowner is going to make an argument that he's got to have this time. So how are we going to prove reasonableness or unreasonableness? Well, I say this partly tongue-in-cheek, but we may need to fly in an RV loading expert. Some guy from Idaho who's in the RV business who's going to say, you know, the average person should be able to load an RV for a two-week trip in 48 hours. And the homeowner is going to bring in their RV loading expert who's going to say, hey, a two-week trip from here to Maine, uh, you know, that's, that's a four-day load. And then you're going to have, and it's going to be ridiculous, of course, and I'm painting a picture to point out the absurdity of this, that that's the problem we have with these provisions that are drafted for us by developers. And as we said earlier, you can either believe that it's developer inattention or you could believe that it's developer intention to make it read to a buyer that it could allow whatever conduct they think they might engage in. Okay, so when you start with that premise, uh, it's no wonder that we tend to have challenges when it comes to the CCNR provisions. Okay, let's talk about towing for a minute. When it comes to towing, it's kind of um, a, a problem uh, that, that has solved itself in some ways. Uh, the question is, can a community association tow vehicles from association-owned streets? Uh, there's pretty much consensus on this topic. Association owns the street. The association can tow. What we prefer to see is sort of a best practice, is that the CCNRs have a provision that says you can't park on the public street, and if you do, you're going to get towed. So a CCNR provision that makes us you know, absolutely happy as lawyers is a provision like this. The board shall have the right to have any vehicle which is parked in violation of the project documents towed away at the sole cost and expense of the owner. And then any expense incurred by the association has to be reimbursed by the owner. So something simple like that. Now, if I were critiquing the drafting of this provision, the one word I don't like is the word away. It just seems kind of weak, you know. Have the car towed away away where, you know, someplace <laughs> else. Um, but basically, it's a pretty strong provision. And if our client came to us and said, hey, we got sued for towing somebody, but we, we can do it in our documents. You've complied with the documents. You certainly have the authority. On an association-owned street, CCNR say you can tow, you can do it. In Arizona, however, there are some other requirements. There's a statute. It's a statute we don't deal with a whole uh, very much. Um, and it's not in the statute book that you have in front of you. But this statute says that there are specific signage requirements that you have to have when, before you can tow someone's car. And this, of course, makes sense. Somebody walks out of the clubhouse and, and says, where's my car? There's got to be a sign there that has a phone number to tell them where to call so they can go retrieve their car. If you don't have the signage, then the towing is wrongful. Now, the good news in Arizona is that, for the most part, if an association has a privately owned street, 
you're going to engage a towing company that's going to be on call when you call them and say, hey, there's a car parked in the common area or on the street in violation of our parking restriction, you're going to call the towing company you have on contract and they're going to come tow it. That company should, if they're any good, help you with the signage. That's what happens in, in, in the real world when it comes to this kind of stuff. So if you want to be in the business of towing from your privately owned streets, you can do it. Best practice, it's in the CCNRs. And so sometimes we get this question. Well, hey, Scott, we own our streets. We're gated. We have been forever. We've never towed, but we want to, we want to get into the towing business just for kicks and giggles. And for those of you who have done towing, there's nothing giggly about it. You want to irritate an owner, tow their car. Um, but if, you, if the law lines up and if you've done it all correctly, they're angry at, at you temporarily, but they did park in violation and they've got to go get their car. One question that comes up is, well, what if the car is damaged? Who's responsible for that? Well, that's actually an interesting question. You'd hope it's always the tow company because you're not touching it. But if we were reviewing the contract between the association and the towing company, we would look at and make sure that the towing company is 100% responsible for damage when we would require the towing company to have adequate insurance to cover that. And we would make sure that they provide certificates of insurance. And we would make sure that they're actually paying the premium. I mean, this is a big deal. Some guy has a $200,000 Maserati and claims that the whole body's been damaged. It's going to cost $70,000 to fix it. And it was your association that towed them. The fact that the towing company gave you a certificate of insurance that showed they had a million dollars of coverage, but they actually hadn't paid the premium in two months, that's not helping you very much. So we need to be paranoid about this stuff. Um, and my guess is that we're not always as paranoid as we should be. Yeah. Who calls the towing company? Who calls the towing company? Well, typically, uh, what we found in dealing with gated communities, which is typically how this is happening, is that a board member or the manager is calling the tow company. I have had some clients where the tow company is willing because they get paid for tows that they'll just drive through and tow anybody that's in violation of the signage, which is sort of interesting. I mean, you can get that kind of service. Yeah. On the top, the question is, you know, I started with if you own the streets. So if we go to the next question, which is, what about um, uh, where the streets are owned by the municipality? The answer there is bad idea. Bad idea to tow from a publicly dedicated street. First of all, it's hard to get the signage up because typically in a single-family community, the street is going to be next to the lots. And so when you say, where's the association going to put the signage? you actually don't own any property nearby. The sign would actually have to go on my lot. And that's going to be a problem. Uh, but that's not the only problem. The other problem has to do with um, whether your CCNR say you can tow from a publicly dedicated street. So the general answer is it's a bad idea. Kathy? Um, the whole concept of booting is the newer way of doing things. It's, it's less of a nightmare for the homeowner. This requires a phone call and then they pay the fee. Somebody comes and takes it off. The car never leaves. There's no chance of damage generally. But, you know, that concept is new and I never see documents that say tow or boot. The question is, what about booting? Uh, because it's the less invasive but still immobilizes a car. It's cheaper. And the answer is yes. In circumstances where you can tow, I would say you can boot. Now, if you go back to this CCNR provision, it's sort of an interesting question. This says that when you have a vehicle that's parked in violation, you can tow it away. It doesn't say you can immobilize it in place with a boot, where you call the phone number, they take a credit card over the phone, and a couple hours later, some guy comes along, removes the boot, and says, thanks for, you know, whatever. Um, under this provision, booting would be trickier. Now, what we've done here for illustration purposes is we have taken CCNR provisions out of context. And by doing that, there may be other provisions in the CCNRs that would allow booting. Online question, thank you, is does, Shen, can you pull my mic down just two smidges? I'm getting a little bit of feedback over here on the thing. Um, 
Would it apply to the vehicle of a guest? And yes, you can tow a vehicle of a guest, but the signage is key. You have to have no parking signs posted, and the guest has to be able to go get their car when they're done. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. No, no, a note on the windshield would not qualify as signage. When the statute talks about signage, we're talking about literally signage that's where the cars are parked, so when the person comes out and finds their car isn't there, that they'll be able to call a phone number and be able to, um, it's over here. They'll be able to call a phone number and um, retrieve their car. Okay, a couple of last things here. Yeah, quick question. Um, is it a specific enough to say um, how many feet in between, uh, how many sign, signs should be in certain? Yes. Is the statute specific enough to say how many feet there should be? The answer is yes. The statute does address where, this, where the signs need to be. I don't have it memorized, and the towing companies, if they're any good, are going to set up the community and say, okay, before we're going to tow anything, we've got to have all the signs set up in compliance with the statute. Great question. Would it be a problem if some homeowners called the towing company to report cars in violation? This is actually quite tricky. In some ways, the towing company is not going to care because they're going to get a fee for doing it. Here's the problem. When homeowners are now allowed to invoke the association's enforcement mechanisms on their neighbors directly, we run the risk that the racist homeowner is going to keep an eye on the Vietnamese American family's cars and the moment they park on the street they call the tow company and the association is going to get tangled up in that fair housing discrimination case because the association let its enforcement mechanisms be co-opted by a racist so that the association's enforcement through towing is disproportionately placed on the protected family uh, from a race standpoint. And so generally the answer is no. We would not want random homeowners calling the tow company. The towing companies that I work with make you list who's authorized to call and they're not going to take a call from Yeah, it's best practice for the towing company to have a list of authorized calls. Bill? Scott, let's take your analogy that you just used about the Vietnamese for a second. You've got that racist and you have a policy against them calling it in. Should only be a board member or manager and that racist does it anyway and you get that mistake made the towing company goes out there it's towed how much exposure is there now for the association on that scenario in my scenario where the Vietnamese family gets called in by a racist neighbor but it happens anyway despite best efforts to limit it to the manager and the board member what's the exposure well, I think it depends on the facts and circumstances. If they get towed three times in three months and nobody else ever gets towed because that one guy is on top of it, I think you've got some fair housing exposure. But let's be clear on the fair housing piece. Letting a board member call in doesn't solve the problem that perhaps the board member is the racist. <laughs> and by the way, so we're equal opportunity here, a manager could be a racist as well. So we always have fair housing risk when we enforce the documents. And you say, well, what's the way out of that? Don't enforce them. But I already said you have to. So it's a risk that, that's embedded in the system. Uh, but racism could be anywhere, and you could develop the idea you're going to pick on somebody for any reason. But if ultimately it is indeed that that person is violating the rule, does it really matter? Great question. Does it matter if ultimately they're violating? Does it matter if there's a discriminatory intent or fair housing? The answer is yes, absolutely. You, everybody has to comply. But the, uh, it's the enforcement where you, you get a little extra enforcement if you're in a, member, a racial minority. That's wrong. That's messed up. That's going to get you in huge trouble. Yeah. The problem, and I've been doing this for a long time, that I see in my community, and I'm <coughs> Well, it's the police department. You have people that violate. I had a phone.
fire in my community, the fire truck could not get to the house when we got the fire because people were parked on the street. And it's normally a street that doesn't have a problem. It just happens to be two cars on the street right alongside each other, the fire truck will be passed. Next it'll be an ambulance. I don't understand why the legislature doesn't pass laws to enforce the cars, the parking restrictions, whether it's public or private, because they're the ones that built these roads too smooth, too small, too narrow for emergency vehicles to pass. And they put the board in a, in a vicarious position to try to enforce something. So the only thing I've done is raise the fines and I go after it. But I mean, I had two um, Winnebago's parked in my community and I called the police for over two weeks and nothing happened. Well, you raise a great, yeah, you raise a great point. The point is that uh, sometimes the streets are designed and built in a way that makes emergency vehicle access difficult, if not impossible, and that the legislature really should be helping associations with these things because it's a public safety issue and they've designed the roads. For whatever reason, that has never happened, and I don't think it will happen, and it's one of those things where the association is but a thought in the mind of a city planner and a developer. You really think about it, you got vacant land, you got a developer, you got a city planner. They get together and they approve a project. It costs them nothing to shift an, uh, a, a need to the association. So there's a perfect example of this shift that goes on. It's called the conspiracy of developers and city planners. And we got to appreciate developers and we got to appreciate city planners. I'm not making them the bad guy, but you think about it. The number one thing that a city planner wants is a beautiful community. They also want tax revenue, and they don't want additional city burdens. How do they do that? Common area owned by the association, paid for through assessments on the owners. The association's not in the room. You're not there either. The homeowners are not there. The board's not there. The management company's not there. Nobody's there to say, wait, don't put that on us. We get the hand we're dealt. And so when we talk about roads that are badly designed or bad CCNR provisions, which we've looked at three of them, we, get, we, either, we either go to the legislature and say, help us be more enforcing, which is conceptually not going to happen, or we just have to figure out how to deal with it. And I'm not, I'm not ignoring your point, but it is, that is the lay of the land that we're talking about. Right. And then, you know, you have homeowners that try to play the game, and it's happened to me many times. They'll park all over the community. Yeah, homeowners that will move from place to place yeah. to try to avoid the parking restrictions. Yeah. I have a question. So we were wondering if we could restrict the parking to parallel parking. Great question. You have publicly dedicated streets. You have a cul-de-sac that on the weekends becomes a parking lot. Can you restrict it to parallel parking or something like that rather than people kind of going nose in? Is that what they're doing up to the curb, perpendicular to the curb? Your question really raises a question that I hadn't contemplated covering today, but I'm glad to because it's an excellent question. And that is, can the board deal with parking through board enacted rules or does it have to be a CCNR amendment? That's a big question because if the board can solve this problem through board rules then we don't have the amendment problem that I spent that time earlier talking about. This whole idea of enforce or amend, why amend them if the board can just make a rule? So the answer to the question of whether or not the board can enact rules through a board resolution at a board meeting about parking on a publicly dedicated street is answered in your CCNRs. Some CCNRs have a provision that says something like the following. The board can enact rules and regulations regarding use of the common area. If that's your rule and regulation empowerment provision in the CCNRs, then I don't think you can do it because the streets are owned by the city they're not common area, and you're not restricting conduct in the common area. If, however, the CCNRs say the board can adopt rules and regulations regarding conduct inside the project, inside the four corners of the association proper, that's pretty broad. That implies that the board can adopt a rule regarding your conduct on a lot or perhaps even on a publicly dedicated street. The problem with that, so we could say, well, theoretically, yeah, I guess you could. Well, you can enact it. 
The question is, is it enforceable? What are you going to do when someone violates? Are you going to impose a fine on them? Are you going to end up in court? Are they going to sue you? Are you going to end up in a fair housing dispute? And that's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, where you say, is a judge going to let the board, through a board-adopted rule, fundamentally change the way people can park on a publicly dedicated street? It doesn't take a lawyer to say, that seems a little iffy, doesn't it? I mean, you're a judge. Let's say you're a judge for a day. HOA walks in and says, hey, this is a publicly dedicated street, and although the CCNRs say what they say or don't say about parking, we've got this problem on the cul-de-sac. We don't like that people park nose to the curb, perpendicular. We want them parallel. And so we adopted a rule. Is that judge going to let your rule regard conduct on the, common, uh, on the city street? It all depends on what your CCNRs say. Yes, it does. It, it, because the CCNRs empower you to make those rules, it then becomes part of the contract. And consequently, you would make an argument then uh, to the judge that the uh, contract principle applies. You can make those rules, and those rules become enforceable. Excellent point. The point uh, made from our friend in the back, who actually is a retired judge um, from Michigan on a board in uh, Fountain Hills. Um, the point is that if your CCNRs say that the board can adopt rules regarding conduct in the association, then the owners did agree to that. That's part of the contract, and that is the argument that we would make. Um, at the end of the day, though, a judge might just say, I don't like it. Um, I'm sure you never did that when you were on the bench, but uh, some, some judges in Maricopa County do that. All right, last question, then I'll keep moving. Yes? Couldn't they just go to, because it's municipal, couldn't they just go to the village and ask them to paint in the stripes? Uh, parallel and um, does it have to go through the board? Good question. If you're in a city and you've got this cul-de-sac problem, could you go to the city and ask them to paint something or do something to the street to change the behavior on the streets? And I would say absolutely. It's worth, worth asking. Worth asking the municipality if they'd help with the problem. That would be the fastest way to solve it. Absolutely. Now, whether they come out and enforce it or not is an entirely different question, but that would be a good way to do it. Let's look at an ordinance from the city of Scottsdale. I've just plucked this out by random. There's a Scottsdale city ordinance that says the following. No person shall, which means you are prohibited from, no person shall park a vehicle except when necessary to avoid conflict with other traffic in any of the following places. You cannot park here unless you have to to avoid traffic. You cannot park in Scottsdale in front of a public or private driveway or the entrance to an alley. Now that's really stating the obvious, isn't it? I cannot park my car on a street in Scottsdale that blocks your driveway. So that's intuitively obvious. But let's assume for the sake of discussion today that that's the only thing that the City of Scottsdale Ordinance says about parking on publicly dedicated streets. It isn't, but for purposes of today, let's assume that's it. That's not much. And if you go back to the first picture I showed you of the guy with the RV in front of his neighbor's house, that actually doesn't violate this provision. And so we don't get a lot of help from municipal codes and regulations. Even if it's in there, you're not going to get a lot of help from the enforcement side. Now, in the city of Scottsdale, if you cannot get out of your driveway because someone's parking on the street in front of your driveway, the police will address that situation because that's considered a health safety issue and there's a simple question about legal access to your own property, I think the city of Scottsdale police would get involved in this ordinance. But in the question of the RV in front of someone else's house on a publicly dedicated street, they may or may not get involved, at least not on this example. So we don't get a whole lot of help here. Let's talk briefly about the planned community parking statute. In the Condominium Act, there is no statute about parking. In a condominium, the entirety of the topic of parking is covered in your CCNRs, or not covered in your CCNRs, but the totality of the parking topic is in the doc documents of a condo. There's no statute that trumps anything that says anything about the topic. But in a planned community, we do have a statute. And you might say, well, why in one and not the other? Well, the guy who got irritated with his HOA and went to the legislature happened to live in a planned community. That's the explanation. There's no philosophical reason. There's no justifiable theory as to why homeowners with certain kinds of cars and planned communities get to keep them, but the same vehicle in a condominium 
might not be able to keep it. So here's how it goes. The statute is ARS 33-1809. It's in the book on the table, which I'm happy to have you take with you. And here's what it says, basically. An owner can park their vehicle in the street or on the driveway. Now let's go back to that very first CCNR example where it said you have to park in the garage or on the driveway. And this is one where, let's assume you're in a community that says you can't park on the driveway or the street. If you're this person, which I'm about to tell you the whole exception, you get to park on the street or the driveway, but it has to be a condition of the person's employment, and then you've got to meet some vehicular restrictions. Well, let's pause here at the underlying portion on the screen and say this. What does this mean, a condition of the person's employment? Now, I've been an employee over the years. I've been an employer over the years, and to me, this only has one definition. A condition of one's employment is something that says you'll be fired if you don't meet it. Around here, you might say, well, what are your hours? 8 to 5. Monday through Thursday, we close at 2.30 on Friday. Pretty simple, 40-hour week. Um, the receptionist needs to be here at 8, right? It's a condition of employment. I can't have the front desk unmanned until 11.30. My receptionist can't work from home, okay? That is a condition of employment. You want to work here, you got to be here at 8 or a little bit before to have the doors open or whatever the issue is. That's a condition of employment. In the statute here, it's as simple as it, as it appears. In order for a homeowner who has a vehicle that they want to keep in violation of your CCNRs, they have to meet the, the conditions of the exception in the statute. And the first condition is that they will be fired from their job if they cannot meet these, um, the, the rest of these, if they can't have the vehicle at their house. So what are the other expectations? Well, you have to be an employee of a public service corporation regulated by the Corporation Commission or a municipal utility, and your job has to be that you're required to be available for emergency deployments for the repair, maintenance, or for the repair and maintenance of natural gas, electrical, telecommunications, or water infrastructure. And the vehicle has a gross vehicle weight rating of 20,000 pounds or less. The vehicle is owned or operated by the Public Service Corporation. The vehicle bears an official emblem and a visible designation of the utility. Or, still condition of employment, or you are, the homeowner is employed by a public safety agency, including police or fire service or an ambulance service provider. And here the vehicle has a gross vehicle weight rating of 10,000 pounds or less and bears an official emblem or other visible designation of the agency. So why 20,000 gross vehicle weight in one instance and 10,000 in another? Because different people tell different stories and they just want a law that lets them keep their vehicle. That's how these things end up being different. It's actually kind of frustrating if you're a citizen who has big ideals about how government ought to work. These are, these are here because individuals went to the legislature and said there ought to be a law, and a legislator said there ought to be a law. And so this is how we end up with it. No, you, the condition applies to both. The condition is it has to be, the, the way you fit into the exception is it has to be a condition of employment and then either it's the water electrical infrastructure or it's the public service agency. So we get to the end and we say, okay, what does all this mean? Well, for some people they say, you know, Scott, I don't know where this came from. It never comes up. But we don't care that there's a DPS officer who parks his cruiser in the driveway. We kind of like it. What association in their right mind would pick on the DPS officer who's got the cruiser in the driveway in the middle of the community? It's a deterrent. The teenagers who are out trying to get into trouble are going to see that DPS car and they're going to be less likely. What boards are so fixated on this that we ever had to have this law in the first place? I don't know. But the DPS car is sort of an interesting question. <coughs> I've known a few DPS officers over the years, and they are encouraged to take their cruisers home. The department likes them being on duty from home to wherever their beat is, and um, they can perhaps have one less car. They don't have to commute in their own car, the price of gas, the whole thing. The whole system works pretty well. 
But when you talk to the DPS officers and you say, well, would you be fired if you couldn't take your cruiser home? The answer is, no, I guess not. It's encouraged, but I don't think I'd lose my job if I told my commander, I can't take the cruiser home anymore. Why not? Nah, the HOA. It's not a condition of employment per se for a DPS officer, as I understand it, to have their cruiser in their driveway at their home. It's encouraged, but not a condition of employment. So when we talk about condition of employment, it's actually a pretty important question. So here's the issue. This doesn't actually come up that often. Why not? Well, I think there are basically two reasons that this doesn't come up that often. One is associations just don't pick the fight. I mean, what's, what's the point? You got the guy who has the carpet cleaning van, you got the guy with the painter's van, you got the other guy with the other vehicle. Why are you going to pick on a City of Mesa water truck any more than you're going to pick on something else? You've got bigger problems. The parking restriction is maddening anyway, and you've got 10 vehicles out of a 100-lot subdivision that are all equally problematic, and the board has basically said, let's just not be in the business. So one reason the statute doesn't come up more often is because boards make the generic decision to sort of back off the whole topic. The second reason it doesn't come up that often, and this is the more dangerous reason, is that managers and board members who read the statute automatically assume that someone fits into the exception because they focus on this slide or this slide, which is the um, public service corporation or the public service agency, and they skip over the condition of employment piece of it and assume that you can meet the exception by virtue of the vehicle itself, when in fact you only fit into the exception if you're an owner, which means you get to park there if it's a condition of employment. Final point on the statute, and I try to make this point as often as I can uh, when I talk about legislation. The legislature is not in the business of empowering associations when it comes to enforcement. They're in the business of taking your power away. So when we look at this statute, we say, well, is this empowering or is this not empowering? This is a statute that says, although it doesn't say it explicitly, here's what it says. If and only if your documents allow you to move your enforcement structure against this particular vehicle, you cannot if it's in this exception. This statute doesn't make your documents any better. If your documents stink for the proposition of regulating a City of Mesa water vehicle on a driveway, they still stink. The statute doesn't make it any better. The statute only comes into play if your documents are great for the proposition that the guy with the City of Mesa water truck has to move it off the driveway. Then you ask the question whether they fit the exception of the statute. But if they don't fit the exception of the statute and your documents stink for regulating the car or the, the water truck on the driveway, they still stink. You read that statute beginning to end, there's not one word of it that says associations can enforce parking restrictions against any vehicle that doesn't fit the exception in this statute. It doesn't say that. It says if and only if your parking restrictions would otherwise let you do something about this vehicle, you cannot if the owner and the vehicle meet the exception. That's what the legislature does. They take your documents and assume you have the authority and then take it away. They trump your documents. They don't make your documents any better. Okay, a couple of final thoughts and then I'll take a few questions at the end. Publicly dedicated streets. I started with this concept. I mentioned it briefly in the middle. I'm mentioning it again. This is a takeaway point. Parking restrictions on publicly dedicated streets are enforceable because it's a contract. We agreed. I had the right to paint my house purple, but I chose not to by agreeing not to in the CCNRs. I had the right to park on the street, but I said I wouldn't. That's the compact, the contract, the covenant. Well, we don't like to tow from publicly dedicated streets. That's generally a bad idea. But we can impose fines and go to court and get injunctions. There's a very simple explanation. I've learned this over the years, working a lot with community managers and boards. Why doesn't this happen more often? Well, I'm not going to ask anybody to react or raise a hand, but if the community managers in the room, there is a species of manager who would say, if they could keep it a secret, you know, if the legislature were to say we can't enforce parking restrictions in publicly dedicated streets, I'd be happier in my job. Oh, you admit it. Okay. <laughs> um, 
because this is so maddening for the average community manager. So if you're in the profession of being a professional community manager, you might say to yourself, you know, if, if the legislature just said there's nothing an association can do about a car parked on a publicly dedicated street, I'd be okay with it. My job satisfaction would go up. That's okay. But board members need to come to grips with this reality as well. It's like rolling a, a, a stone uphill. It's difficult. It can be done, but it's difficult. So when we talk about the legislature, they're in session. They started yesterday. And I will be doing a webcast legislative preview. No one will be in the room here, but you will, can watch online. And I mentioned it earlier. For those of you watching, come back next Tuesday at 2.30 at carpenterhazewood.com slash live. No usernames or passwords required. And you can watch uh, a legislative preview, and hopefully I'll have a handout downloadable on the screen for that as well. So when we talk about the legislature tying all this together with parking, here is the statutory language that has been introduced at the legislature every year for about the last five years. It says this, very simple. This is their fix to associations run amok with parking restrictions on publicly owned streets. Here's what it says. No matter what your documents say, and after the developer's done, which doesn't make a lot of philosophical sense, why can you do it under developer control but not after, Let's pause there for a second. Why is that? Cynically, they have better lobbyists, I think. Um, you know, that legislators are just convinced that the developer should do whatever the heck the developer wants to while they're in control. But when the homeowners take over, it's somehow more insidious when the association wants to do something about the car and the cul-de-sac on the publicly dedicated street. And part of us should sort of recoil at this. Well, why is that? Shouldn't it be the same regardless of whether the developer controls the board or not? I mean, this stuff just kind of slips by us because we're so used to it. But we should be offended that the legislature so often carves out this developer time because one could say, well, they're assuming the developer is going to make good decisions and the homeowner board is going to be evil and make bad decisions and pick on people. If that's the motivation, that should be insulting. Got myself all worked up there. I mean, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> Okay, no matter what the documents say, and only after the developer's gone, because they're the good guy and you're the bad guy, an association has no authority over and shall not regulate any roadway for which the ownership has been dedicated to or is otherwise held by governmental entity. What's interesting about this language, which is not the law, it's been proposed several times over the years, is that what's missing. The word vehicle, gone. The word parking doesn't exist. It's attempt to be so philosophical and esoteric and sort of 10,000 feet begs the question, is my enforcement of your commitment not to park on the street, back to that contract idea, is that violate the statute? Let's look at it from that standpoint. No matter what the documents say, an association has no authority over and shall not regulate any roadway for which ownership has been dedicated. If I say your RV violates a promise you made that you wouldn't park there, in holding you to the terms of your promise that you wouldn't park there, is that attempt to hold you to your commitment, the association exercising authority over the roadway? Or is it regulating the roadway? Maybe, probably. I mean, they probably got close enough. But this is what drives me crazy as a volunteer lobbyist at the legislature for the last 15 years. They make it more complicated than it needs to be. That's how we end up with weird statutes, is you have this attempt to regulate parking and vehicles on publicly dedicated streets and never once use the word vehicle and never once use the word parking. So this is what we're up against. Final point, we have an army of grassroots participants in the legislative process. It is extremely easy. And I have dedicated myself to making it as simple as possible. We've got the legislative preview next week, free of charge, no usernames, no passwords, just sit in front of your computer. But the, the other way you can participate is by talking to your legislator. And uh, on this level, we've also made it extremely easy here at Carpenter Hazelwood. We have a blog. I've done it three years. So this will be my fourth year. Uh, let me give you the website because I didn't put it in the handout. www.azhoalegislation.com. Azhoalegislation.com. There are two ways to interact with the blog. One, you can check it every day and see what's new. But the other way, which is kind of cool, is you can put your email address in there, and you will only get an email when I update the blog. If I do five blog updates on one day, you'll get one email, kind of a digest, and you can click on it and get more detail. 
But if I go five days without blogging, then you won't get an email. There's nothing intrusive. You're not going on a list. It's a separate database within the blog um, server that is limited to that. So you're not going to get anything else. Um, there's no advertising or anything like that. It is purely a public service to try to keep people informed. We have gotten much, much better. Years ago, we were sort of incapable of fighting anything. Last year, we fought everything. Only one bill got through, and it's kind of annoying now with some things in it that were kind of unexpected. But it was a pretty good year. We're looking for a great year this year. And so far, no bills have been introduced. And that's sort of interesting because often these things have been pre-filed. Or was there one introduced today? No, it's only one. That's only been one, but often these legislators pre-file them, something like that. All right, we've run out of time. I will be here for questions. A number of attorneys at the firm are here. Uh, let me just introduce them quickly. Uh, Mark Saul, a uh, new partner in the firm as of January 1, is here. Chad Meissen is also here. Lindsay Stearns, Kelly Callahan, and Jeff Wilhelmy. Jeff is standing in the back. He's the newest attorney who joined our firm last November and spends a lot of time in our litigation department. So if you have a question for me or any one of them, feel free to ask. And uh, we'll close at this point, and then you can come up if you have any questions. Thanks.